Hi, and welcome to module 8 of a brief introduction to game theory. In the previous module, we discussed different types of preferences individuals might have. Doing so raises a natural question we did not address in that module, which is, what if people are heterogeneous in their preferences? In other words, what if people have different utilities across a population? Some people might be altruistic, some people might be inequality-averse, and some people might be simply selfish, for instance. What happens then? Well, that's a subset of a much larger question, which is, what if I have uncertainty over the opponents I'm facing? Right? All the times we've been drawing prisoner's dilemmas, we've been very clear about what kind of opponent we've been facing. Right? In these cases, the opponent is always identical to us, but we could have different preferences in which the opponent were not identical to us. Um, but in all these cases regardless, we know what kind of opponent we're facing. And when I say we know what kind of opponent we're facing, what I mean is we know their utilities. We understand how they translate outcomes and utilities so we can figure out how they're going to behave optimally, rationally. What happens if we don't know that? Well, a simple answer to that, qu to that um, question is nothing. We can't do anything. If we had no knowledge in the slightest of who we're facing, we can't possibly figure out what they want or what they're going to do in some strategic behavior, so we can't do any game theory. That, of course, is a problem if I'm trying to understand how people behave, so I know how I should behave as part of some equilibrium behavior profile. Um, I need to know who I'm facing, and I need to be able to know what they're going to do, and if I know nothing, I can't do anything. So. Um, one way to get around this problem is to translate this sort of incomplete information about who I'm facing into some imperfect information about who I might be facing. And the way we do that is we translate this uncertainty over different types of opponents we might face into some set of beliefs over the types of opponents we might face. That sounds kind of similar, but the major difference is now we assign probabilities to each of some set of possible types of opponent we might play. Now, once we've done that, we can figure out what would happen given play, given some strategy that you play, given each one of the types of opponents you might play. And since we know the probability that each type of opponent occurs, or that you meet each type of opponent, we can calculate an expected utility for a given strategy. To do that, um, so, so basically, just to reiterate, we assign beliefs, some prior set of beliefs, over the different types of agents we might play, we might play different types of actors we might encounter. Um, and each type here is just an actor, a player, with a different set of preferences, a different set of utilities, a different utility function. So type here is synonymous with different utility function. To do that, we're going to have to make a slight extension to our Nash equilibrium concept. This extension leads to what's called a Bayesian Nash equilibrium for, out of, for Bayes' rule, which we're not going to talk about too much in this, um, at all, really, I think, in this lecture. Um, but if you go on in game theory, you'll see a lot more. But um, the idea is we extend the Nash equilibrium in two ways. One we've already said. Now, my optimum strategy my optimum strategy profile depends on not just what I would do optimally for each individual type of player, but also my beliefs of the types of players I encounter. And my strategy must be optimal given my beliefs about the possible set of players I encounter and the chance I encounter each of them. And I'll show you an example to make that a little more concrete, but the idea is I have to consider what I believe is likely to happen and who I, and what kind of players I believe I'm likely to encounter. The second difference from Nash equilibrium is for every type of player I might be, that type needs to calculate an equilibrium, um, an equilibrium in play. So for instance, I'm, other players might think I'm of two types. Maybe one type is selfish and one type is altruistic. And in that case, they have to figure out um, what I do, so each type of my, to make that work, each type of that I could be, I know what I am, but each type I could be has to figure, has to have assigned to that type an equilibrium strategy. So again, for each type I might be, I need to figure out what the equilibrium play would be. And I need to figure out um, for each of the other type 
my, my opponent, um, what beliefs I have over the types they could be, and also what the um, uh, what they're going to play in equilibrium as well. Okay, so let's see how that actually works in practice. Um, and let's use a, a modified prison dilemma. So here is the normal prison dilemma, and we're going to say these these are the payoffs played by selfish types. Okay. These are the types um, who are selfish. They want they, they, the individual incentive is compelling to them, and they want to play um, defect as a dominant strategy because it's compelling to them. And let's compare them to uh, to more altruistic types. And let's not do the simple altruism one, let's do a um, uh, the, the mixed sort of one, where they have higher benefit for cooperation, but it's not a, but cooperation is not a dominant strategy, as it was in the previous example. Okay, so now we have two types of player. Um, if both types are selfish, this is the game they're playing. If both types are altruistic, this is the game they're playing, on the right. If one type is one, one type is the other, then one type has payoffs that look like the left, and one type looks like the, the one on the right. Okay. So what do we do with this? Okay. So the first thing we do with this is we have to figure out for each type I might be, what should I do? Well. What if I'm the selfish type? What should I do? From the selfish type, well, we know that it's always a dominant strategy to do to um, engage in defection, for, regardless of what my opponent does. Always. Okay. That doesn't change if my opponent's altruistic. I don't really care what their payoffs are. My payoffs are still dominant for defection. So the selfish type of me is going to always play defect. And that's true for my opponent as well. If my opponent's a selfish type, they will always play defect. There is no question. Okay, so let's forget about that one completely. Where that's done. What about if I'm an altruistic type? What should I do? Well, there's two possibilities here. First, let's ask: Is it an equilibrium for me to play defect always? And the answer is yes. So let's say I'm an altruistic type. If my opponent's altruistic, we know from from earlier analysis that there are two equilibria here. Right? Defect, defect, and cooperate, cooperate. So playing defect against other um, other uh, uh, altruistic types would still be an equilibrium if they play defect too. And if I play a selfish type, I definitely should play defect, defect, even if I am altruistic. Right? We can see that by noting that even if I'm altruistic, and here's an example of my being altruistic and their being selfish. So I get this, they get this, and this is still this. This is an example of a altruistic player one playing a selfish player two. In that case, um, they are going to want to deviate to defect always. It's a dominant strategy for them, so they only play defect, and therefore it's dominant for me to play defect as well. So we know it is an equilibrium for altruistic types to always play defect as well. That's not super interesting, though. The question is, can there be a possibility of having an equilibrium in which altruistic types at least cooperate with each other? We know whenever they encounter selfish types, there'll still be bad outcomes, but can we have an equilibrium in which the, co which the altruistic types at least cooperate when they meet each other, um, or in general? So let's see. Now we know that altruistic types can't condition behavior on who they meet because they won't know who they meet ahead of time. There's no signs in people's bodies that say, I'm selfish or I'm altruistic. Now, in practice, in real life, right, um, you can rely upon past behavior and so on, with reputations and repeated game, repeated interactions. That's all true. In this simplified game, though, you meet people once, you've never seen them before, you've never seen them again, um, so you can't know who you're facing. So it's like a new interaction. Okay, so can there be an equilibrium in which, so in that case, the strategy that, a, that the altruistic types play has to be true regardless of who they face. So we're going to try to see if there is a cooperate always strategy possible? So we're going to ask the question, how would it be possible? Well, this is game theory, so all you have to know is that these people are rational, these players are rational, and it can be possible as long as the expected utility for taking the action of cooperate is at least as good as the expected utility for taking the action of defect. So what we all need to do is calculate both expected utilities. So let's see. What's your utility for, defect, for um, cooperating? Well, what does it look like? 
Well, let's say I face off against a selfish type, and I'm cooperating. Selfish types always defect, so I'm going to get a zero. So if I face a selfish type, um, I get a zero. Now, what's the chance I face a selfish type? We're going to need to assign probabilities to these things, right? We need prior beliefs. Let's say there's a p probability of an altruistic type. And let's say there's a 1 minus p probability of a selfish type. Those are good probabilities. They add to 1, so that's all great. Um, so, there's a zero, so we get a path of 0 when facing a selfish type. So that's 0 times 1 minus p. Now what happens if we face an altruistic type? We're proposing an equilibrium here in which altruistic types cooperate always. So if I'm cooperating and I face a an altruistic type, they will also cooperate in this equilibrium. So I will get 3 because we'll both be cooperating. So I'll get 3 and what's that multiplied by? The chance I face an altruistic type, which is just p. So this utility is 3p. Now what happens if I face off against a, um, sorry, what happens if I play defect instead? What do I get? It's going to be a safer option. Well, if I face a, a, a selfish type, I get 1 because they're both defecting. So I avoid the 0 payoff. That happens with probability 1 minus p as before. If I face a altruistic type, an altruistic type, um, I'm going to defect instead of cooperating. I take advantage of that one. Because I'm altruistic, my payoff of taking advantage of them is only 2 in that case. So I get a payoff of 2 for defecting when they cooperate as an altruistic type. And the chance that I um, meet an altruistic type is again p. So what's this? Well, it's 1 minus p plus 2p, which is 1 plus p. So I'm going to cooperate as long as 3p is greater than or equal to 1 plus p, or, um, as is becoming pretty common lately, um, p has to be greater than or equal to 1 half. As usual, the 1 half is just to the parameter choices. But the key here is, this is the condition that's required for cooperation to happen. There's always an equilibrium where altruistic types defect always. There's also a second equilibrium sometimes in which altruistic types cooperate always. Selfish types never do. There's only one equilibrium for selfish types. They defect always. But there are two possible equilibria for altruistic types. Um, defect always and sometimes cooperate always is also an equilibrium, but that's the only equilibrium if p is greater than or equal to a half in this case. What does that mean substantively? It means your chance of encountering an altruistic type is greater than or equal to one half. That makes intuitive sense if you think about it, right? Your only benefit for cooperating always occurs when you meet altruistic types. When you meet selfish types, you're being penalized. So the more you meet selfish types, the less you're going to want to cooperate. However, altruistic types give you a better payoff. So the more you meet altruistic types, the higher the benefit is to you for cooperating in general. So as P gets bigger, it becomes easier to maintain a cooperative equilibrium because you're more often meeting people like you who are going to cooperate with you and give you the higher payoff. That's it. Um, so what we've done is we've calculated, we've computed a Bayesian Nash equilibrium for this game. We've assigned equilibria for every type that you might be, selfish or altruistic. And we've calculated expected utilities given our beliefs about what our um, opposing player, type, what types of person our opposing player might be. What types, again, is defined by what the utility functions are, what their payoffs are. And we've figured out that as the chance that we meet altruistic types increases, we are increasing our um, benefit for cooperation, and we are more likely to actually have an equilibrium around um, in which cooperation can be sustained. And that's it. Um, thank you very much.